Coming up tonight, this building on Thompson Road will be demolished to make way for the upcoming North-South Corridor Tunnel. Six men have been arrested for buying contraband cigarettes from online peddlers. And Singapore reported two new community COVID-19 cases for the first time since March 3rd. This is The Straits Times News Night. I'm Dylan Ang. Good evening, I'm Chao Suan. Now, if you're a fan of the adorable little Tanjong Ru Baos and frequented the outlet at Thompson, that familiar building will soon be gone. The building that housed the popular shop is being torn down after concerns over the strength of the building's concrete. It is just metres away from an upcoming tunnel for the North-South Corridor. Built on freehold land, the 57-year-old building with 12 residential units and 4 commercial units has to be acquired and demolished before excavation works on the NSC tunnel can begin as a result of the safety concerns. The building at 68 to 74 Thompson Road is the only building located near the 21.5km NSC that has been assessed as requiring foundation strengthening works. Six men five Chinese nationals and one Malaysian were arrested in an enforcement operation which targeted those who bought duty unpaid cigarettes from online peddlers. The Straits Times accompanied the enforcement officers on Tuesday afternoon. At an industrial building in 2nd Chin Bi Road, four men in blue collared shirts were led out by customs officers into vans where they were informed about the offence they had committed. Of the six, three of the men arrested have been charged in court while investigations are ongoing for the others. Singapore has reported two new community COVID-19 cases for the first time since March 3rd. They are among the 34 new infections confirmed today. The remaining 32 were all imported and have been placed on stay-home notice upon arrival here. And a top infectious diseases doctor has told us that there's no need for Singapore to mix and match vaccines. It comes as a shortage of COVID-19 vaccine supplies and rising safety concerns prompted scientists around the world to explore the concept of combining vaccines. Now, experts say that while it is possible that mixing could incite a more robust immune response, they warn that more studies are needed to ascertain efficacy and safety. Now, what about Singapore, where there isn't a shortage of vaccines? Do we have a reason to look into mixing vaccines? Duke NUS Medical School's Professor Wee Eng Yong shared his view with The Big Story earlier today. Uh, short answer is no. I don't think it's, this is beneficial to Singapore. Uh, mm. Two reasons. One is obviously we, we have a, a, a decent supply of vaccines and it's going well. The second reason is that we don't have a lot of cases here. So there's no need to go and um, um, mix and match the vaccine, especially when we don't know, um, you know, we, we can't contribute uh, new data to whether the, that, that kind of mixing and matching would give rise to the same efficacy. So in, in Singapore's context, unless there's suddenly a big outbreak, which you know, is looking very unlikely, uh, that we, we should just continue with the, the kind of a, a vaccination program that is currently in place. Now, besides the mixing of vaccines, there's also increasing talk around the world that vaccine booster shots will likely be required at some point. Just last night, the Chief Science Officer for the White House COVID response team told lawmakers that the US is working to ensure that it can obtain booster shots if they become necessary. So I think that for planning purposes, for planning purposes only because there's no decision, I think we should expect that we may have to boost and probably have to boost, again, no decision. But the current thinking is that certainly those who are more vulnerable may have to go first. But I think you have with many vaccines, we understand that at a certain uh, point in time, we need to boost, whether that's nine months, 12 months, and we are preparing for that coming. And the floodgates have opened after Japan said it would release treated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the ocean. The plan has been harshly criticised by its neighbours, including the two Koreas and Taiwan. China in particular is not happy it has even dared Japanese officials to drink the wastewater from Fukushima. 
Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Litian said on Twitter, Japanese politicians said treated wastewater is innocent. Why don't they drink, cook and wash clothes with the water first? Japan Finance Minister Taro Aso sidestepped queries on the comments and said Fukushima water contamination levels are below international guideline limits. Mr Aso has also said the water seemed safe enough to drink. And in Hong Kong today, Jimmy Lai, the 73-year-old founder of Apple Daily Newspaper and pro-democracy activist, was handed a 12-month prison sentence. He was among nine activists sentenced today for participating in an unauthorized assembly during the 2019 anti-Beijing protests. Let's take a look at what's been trending on social media today. Google Earth is getting its biggest update in years with the addition of a new layer, Time. Time-lapse lets you see how the planet changed over the years from 1984 to 2020 thanks to more than 24 million satellite photos. Now here's two changes that stood out to me, a frightening look at deforestation of the Amazon rainforest in Bolivia's San Julian over the years. Look at how large chunks of land are being cleared for soybean farming, a similar site in other places like Brazil and Argentina. Now, what about how global warming has shrunk glaciers like the Columbia Glacier in Alaska, for example? Notice how it has retreated more than 20 kilometers since 1984, making it one of the fastest changing glaciers on the planet. Lots to discover and explore on the site. You can visit google.com slash earth to see more. Now, I think lots of us don't think about how climate change affects us till you see it laid out like that. For sure. I mean, it definitely adds up over the years. And hopefully these images will encourage everyone to alter their habits for the sake of the environment. And as the countdown to the Tokyo Olympics continues, many countries are unveiling uniforms and some are getting a little competitive. Now, here's a peek at two looks that have gotten the internet all worked up. The USA's closing ceremony uniforms for the Olympic and Paralympic team have been unveiled. Some have said that the outfits look like something out of an 80s movie, while even more have likened them to astronauts' gear. Not to be outdone, the USA's closest neighbour has since tweeted, We hear people have been curious about our Canadian tuxedos after the release of Ed Team USA's uniforms, accompanied with images of Canada's own closing ceremony outfit, inspired by streetwear and which pays tribute to Tokyo. Denim jackets covered in graffiti. So which is your favourite? Let us know in the comments below. You know I love Canada, but the Team USA's uniform is <laughs> definitely more my style. No, I agree. Now speaking of the Olympics, could this 14-year-old be Sing Singapore's next generation of Olympians? Meet table tennis whiz kid Isaac Quack, the first Singaporean to top the under-15 boys world ranking list, released by the International Table Tennis Federation. Isaac now has his sights set on competing and winning in the higher age category events on the ITTF and World Table Tennis circuits, as well as representing Singapore at major games. In February last year, he won the Cadet Boys Under-15 singles title without conceding a single game at the ITTF Swedish Junior and Cadet Open. Congrats Isaac and so excited to see what's in store for you. Now, if you're looking for something to do over the weekend, how about this? You know, I've been fascinated with Japanese culture since I was a kid, and if you are too, then this might just appeal to you. Life in Edo, Russell Wong in Kyoto opens today at the Asian Civilizations Museum to celebrate 55 years of Singapore-Japan relations. Journey to life during the Edo period through an extensive showcase of woodblock prints and paintings from the era, and peek into the lives of Kyoto's geisha through the Singaporean photographer's images of landscapes and geiko ceremonies, a mind-boggling 13-year-long personal project in the making. Interested? The exhibition runs from April 16 to September 19. Cool stuff. And that wraps up the Straits Times News Night. Do visit straitstimes.com to see more news and videos. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the button below. Have a great evening. We'll see you on Monday.